wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon area in the USA. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about what we've decided to talk about tonight. So tonight we'll talk mostly about, oh, here it is. You want to edit, edit this out later on or shall we keep going? So tonight we'll be talking about, mostly about the politics of mental health funding, the politics of mental health funding. And my guest this evening is Kevin Fitz, who has been on the show a number of times in the past, and he has always been a delight looking and smiling at me. <laughs> How you doing? Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. You've got so much to share to, to teach people about what we're talking about this evening. Yeah. I appreciate the work that you do in giving community people and activists, uh, people who are trying to change the world for the better, a platform to come talk about it. And when you're talking about it, if I get fascinated all over again, just forgive me. Just okay, keep going. sure. <laughs> right. Well, let's see if I can help get you fascinated. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. And so, as each conversation with Dr. Don show consists of two major segments. In the first segment, the Who Are You segment, I talk with my guests a little about who they are personally so that we might get a bit of a, an appreciation why they say what they say. In the second segment, we'll talk about the politics of mental health funding. Now, before we start the main program, I have an unusual uh, request here. It's a, an email I got from the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is one of my favorite organizations. And it came a couple of days ago, and it's important enough for me to interrupt the whole show to read this. The subject is the FBI is threatening racial justice and our free speech rights. Here's something you can do to fight back right now. It says, hi, Donald. The FBI is grouping unconnected black people under the label black identity extremists, black identity extremists for surveillance and investigation despite the fact that no such group exists. The Bureau has refused to provide critical information we requested to learn why this classification even exists and which black people and black-led organizations have been targeted as a result. So today we and the Center for Media Justice sue the FBI. We can't fight this in the courts alone. White supremacist attacks are on the rise and our free speech rights are more crucial than ever. So we, we must all protest this baseless illegal surveillance. As your name, the FBI must stop targeting black activists for surveillance and investigation. The FBI's illegal surveillance of black activists is nothing new. In the 1960s, the FBI conducted covert activities against black leaders who were advocating for a full equality for black people, including Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Now black identity extremists, black identity extremists joins the long list of terms the Bureau has used in an effort to justify surveilling black people. And I'm particularly nervous about, as you can probably guess. Yeah. You could also add Paul Robeson to that. They tracked yeah. him. He, yeah. you know, probably, according to a book I read, he was probably one of the persons who was under surveillance the longest. And that's why I went to Europe. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's see. We'll start by my asking you a few questions, and I've asked you these questions before, but time has passed, and maybe things have changed. Okay. Yeah. So if I would ask your best friend, your best friend. Who is Kevin? What would your best friend say? Be your best friend. Kevin is? I think they would say I'm extremely energetic. Be your best friend. Okay. Kevin is? Kevin is very energetic. Uh-huh. He's uh, a one-man idea factory. Yes. <laughs> uh, he's also somewhat impatient and impulsive. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. And when and where were you born? I was born in Eugene, Oregon. Oh, you're a native yeah. Oregonian. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and uh, why were you born? I was born because uh, my father and mother uh, had a third child, and I was their third child. Uh -huh. yeah. The interesting is, things for our viewers at home is, tomorrow is March 26th. Uh, my birthday is March 26th. I was born 54 years, I was born 54 years ago tomorrow at Sacred Heart Hospital in Eugene, Oregon. 
Thank you. Happy birthday! Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking for another tie-dye t-shirt. <laughs> did you like that one? Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait till some warm weather. To... Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so, any other reason why you were born other than the, the, the information you just gave me? I'm not sure. I don't really, you know, I think we've, I've talked about it before. I don't really, I would, wouldn't define myself as a monotheist. But I do sort of have a sense that my mission on Earth is to help other people who have similar challenges, uh, tribulations, and wounds that I do. So that's maybe why you were born. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to believe that my mission on Earth is to help other people who suffer from severe psychotic disorders and alcoholism and help them get their ship back on course. Do you like it? I love what I'm doing. <laughs> of course. I, I wish I had more money f to have lawyers and a PR department, but I love. I think don't think there's more important work on the planet to help other humans who are in pain or nervous and distress. And and um, how many years have you been doing this? I've been start. I started doing this when I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing it for 30, 32 years. Oh my gosh! Yeah. And you don't get tired of it. No, I don't, <laughs> I, I, especially with the advent of reaching out to new generations of people who are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and like, gosh, I'm glad I find that there was a movement of people who are recovering from mental health and substance use disorders where we can befriend one another. Is there an increase in those kinds of people anymore in our country? Yes, yes. And you know why? Well, I don't know why, but I do know that the increase, particularly with teenage girls and teenage boys, of anxiety teenage. disorder, suicide disorder, start, started spiking going way up in 1995, 96, 97, particularly with teenage girls. Mm. Huge amount of social anxiety, self-harm, suicidal behavior. They think some experts speculate with the rise of social media in mirroring yourself in front of an audience about you know how do I look do I fit in am I with the cool kids has been detrimental to the development of young adult self-esteem and self-worth so what's the remedy for that so remedy is community face-to-face -face, analog community one monkey sitting next to another monkey holding his hand or feeling his heartbeat we we're mammals we need co-regulation you don't get co-regulation from a glassy TV screen. You need to feel the breath and the pulse of the human being next to you. And they need to be a safe object that you can harbor with. Oh, my gosh. You see what I mean? There's more of this coming, so hang on here. <laughs> Let's continue on with the bio segment. Okay, okay. Uh, your racial, national, or cultural heritage, you alluded to that earlier, something about that, your national or cultural heritage. So I did one of these fancy $150 DNA tests and it sent me a map back after they took my saliva and tested my DNA. 90% of my relatives from the past almost a thousand years, 90% of them are all clustered around Wales and, um, and, and uh, Great Britain. The other 10% around Istanbul mm. in, um, in Turkey. And so, it's, so for the last thousand years, as far as I can trace it, 90% of my relatives come from the uh, Wales and, uh, and Great Britain. Can you identify any connection to those people in those countries that nowadays? Not yet, not yet. We, but we have started doing some tracking. We know that my last name, Fitz, F-I-T-T-S, mm -hmm. was not modified. It was actually Fitz, and there's actually a coat of arms that we had in England 800 years ago. A Fitz, F-I-T-T-S, not Fitzgerald, not Fitzsimmons, not uh, Fitz, you know, some people, the Irish, some of those would shorten their their uh, last names because they want, didn't want to buy, be identified as Irish, mm -hmm. or f so I'm told. So, what's your cultural heritage today, besides what you just said? Uh, currently, your cultural heritage, or you're just plain American white, or do you claim red, white, and black like I do, for example? Uh, I uh, claim uh, Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, religious preference. I was raised an Episcopalian. Uh huh. Um, but I, and I value a lot of the rituals and the community and the support that they do of that, but I probably have to say I am an open-minded uh, pagan, I would mm. say. I like that term, pagan. Yeah. <laughs> I have all sorts of names for myself, uh, skeptic, and uh, uh -huh, skeptic. I'm going to go into it because they'll go on forever and ever. Uh -huh. uh, and your formal education? So the last grade that I officially completed in, in formal school was seventh grade. 
Uh, and so due to bullying and a lot of family strife and my father's alcoholism and my mother broke her neck, uh, I didn't complete any higher grade than seventh grade. I went to eighth, ninth, and tenth grade, but I dropped out finally in tenth grade. Went back three years later and got my equivalency degree at a community college. I dropped out in uh, tenth grade too. <laughs> I thought you had a PhD in psychology, I did. doctor. I went back. Oh, okay. Year, oh, right. okay. Okay. I was okay. forty-five became, before okay. I became a PhD. Okay. Well, it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, other education, oh my gosh, you can go on for three hours with that. Yeah, I do. I've had a lot of uh, continuing education in the world of clinical mental health services. I was a, I'm the state of Oregon. I'm a qualified mental health associate, uh, so I'm able to do chart notes and uh, work on psychiatric wards and psych hospitals and group homes. So I've had years and years of ongoing continuing education about. Uh, in the area of clinical mental health practice, and then also in the area of uh, community support services, peer services, outreach, information referral. So I've had a lot of those sort of things. I have a year of community college in sociology and um, psychology. Mm -hmm. And that makes it easier for you to be friendly and have people trust you? I don't know. It was very <laughs> interesting because my sociology professor used to say, I want you to stop obsessing about the sick goldfish until you tell me, is that water polluted that the goldfish lives in? Because I think, you're, I think the people who are telling you that you're sick and the world is sane, uh, I don't think they're telling you the whole truth. He said, I think it's a mad world. I think we're goldfish living in a polluted tank, and we need to take that into consideration when we talk about what's the matter with us. Have you been uh, tested for your IQ? This is controversial to my partner. <laughs> um, my mother told me in fourth grade I was tested and I had 142. Yes. I asked my father that five years ago, and he said, that's not true. <laughs> uh, so I don't know, but I like that. I, I thought was, you know, I like, I like to tell people that I'm highly intelligent. Yes, you are. Yeah, about four or five standard deviations above the mean. Thank you. Even with all this brain damage or years and years of alcoholism and... And, and other things and we, we don't mention them. Yeah, right. <laughs> Antipsychotic drugs, Thorazine, oh Cyprexa. Oh, my God. You've been through the whole yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. my God. And here you are. Look at you. You're just so engaging. I am? I? Yeah. yeah. Well, because that's because you're a good interviewer. Yeah. yeah. I imagine you watched a lot of Phil Donahue when you were a kid because he had a gifted uh, interview style as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyhow, and we know what you're doing in your work ongoing now. Do you have anything else you do? I, <laughs> my goal for summer 2019 is I want, to become, I want to be proficient in what these talented group of gentlemen behind the screen are doing. I want to understand video editing and video production. I want to understand that so I can do it effectively because I spend so much time in front of counties and states and uh, local governments talking about the peer revolution and the peer movement. So I have all this raw video, video of me talking, but I want to do some clever editing because who wants to listen to me talk for 30 minutes about the intricacies of mental health funding and the peer world? I mean, I want to, I want to cut it down to, you know, I want to get proficient about that. I'm starting a podcast in um, early August called The Lunatic Fringe. Oh, my God. See, that's what I mean about your IQ. <laughs> You're off the charts. Well, that was a rock song. I think, that was, I think that was a rock song in the early 70s, Lunatic Fringe. I know you're out there. <clears throat> so anyhow, uh, you have a partner? I have a partner. I have met my partner in 2000 in Washington, D.C., and she's still with me 19 years later. And she, she learned about you, and she's still here? She worked in the area of technical assistance for uh, people, for peers, to try to help them understand grants, understand funding, understand uh, events, and um, how to build self-help groups, drop-in centers. So she was working for one of the largest peer-run technical assistance center on the East Coast, and I met her at a conference in 2000, and, um, and we met, and then it's been a fairy tale ever since, I guess she would tell you. Do you love her? I love her. Yes, she's my. Tell her. Tell she her. is my spiritual Look wife. Yes, I do love her. I. She is. She is. Her spiritual life. What yeah. does that mean? My spiritual wife. wife. We're not actually married technically because of tax situations, but mm. she's my spiritual partner forever. Mm. On this plane and whatever plane, we're in the journey together. 
forever. Mm -hmm. And your political persuasion, are My, you a Trump supporter? Uh, no, I'm not a Trump supporter. People think that I look like a Trump supporter because I sometimes look angry when I get up in the morning because I haven't had enough sleep, but I'm actually not. I am a democratic socialist. You are Bernie Sanders. Kind I'm of a character. Bernie Sanders, a, uh, yeah, uh, Cortez. Yes, I think two of the greatest problems we have in the world are income inequality. Yes, and the great uh, flood that is going to bury all our coasts in the next ten to twenty years. Global warming and income inequality are two catastrophes on the on the human on the planet. How do we head that up? <sighs> Conversations and. Uh, political uh, uh, s political mar uh, statecraft to take over the reins of power. So how do we change our leadership in this country particularly? Well, I think we elect uh, Bernie Sanders and Eliz Bernie Sanders is president and Elizabeth Warren is vice president and they're, they are on the money about income inequality. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are very uh, keen about income inequality as a huge, huge problem. And we've got a battle ahead of us, don't we? We do have a battle ahead of us. We have a battle ahead of us right here in Oregon. In fact, one of the largest employers in Oregon is right here down the street, Nike. And we have, we're, having a bat we're going to have a battle with them and are ongoing in the rest of the legislative session about taxes and what kind of taxes should corporations pay in Oregon. Yeah. Well, they're interested in profit, aren't they? Yep. Are you against profit? I'm not against profit. Of course you're not. No, I'm, of course not. But I am against, uh, you know, s uh, destroying the safety net because of tax cuts for large corporations that don't carry their share. Okay. The difference between sympathy and empathy. I asked you that before, and I'm wondering if uh, you've evolved. I, I, my sense of sympathy is. You don't hard. need to evolve. Incidentally, I was just I've forgotten. That's why I asked you. Again. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I think I'm a, I sometimes think that most people have 10, 10 inch radar on the top of their head. Sometimes I think I have 30 inches of radar on top of my head, where my empathetic, uh, my empathetic um, radar is so sensitive that it's painful to walk down the street in the core of Portland to see these wounded humans. I have a theory, and I think I told you to you before, that when you approach somebody, when we approach somebody in, in emotional or psychiatric distress, there's two. There, there's no. There's no. There's no set point. There's no homeostasis. You either familiarize yourself with a person and engage with their experience, or you or you otherize. You push them away from your heart. Mm -hmm. And we have a whole city of of radical liberals who are up to their ears in compassion fatigue, who are barricading the heart to the suffering of people all around them. So they're lacking, lacking in empathy. I think their empathy circuits are overloaded without solution and they're getting, and they're growing cold and hardened and tired. Fatigue? Yes. Oh my gosh, yeah. Memberships in political, social, or civic organizations and we've only got three hours so only give us about half a dozen. So I <laughs> am, you will probably will not find anybody who is as active in the Democratic Party of Oregon who pushes mental health reform on, from the perspective of a recipient. So I'm extremely active in the Oregon Democratic Party, particularly with the issue of consumer first in uh, healthcare delivery. I'm also a member of the Eastside Democrats Club, which is not a political party, but just a sure. conversation club. and the. Humanists of Greater Portland. I also belong to that, which I find uh, fascinating. Yes. So yeah. those three things, yeah, I think. Yeah. A person from the past or alive today that you admire or look up to, any, any names come to mind? Mahatma Gandhi and Ralph Nader. Yeah, Ralph Nader. Interesting. Why Ralph Nader? I walked out, Ralph Nader, I walked out of the Mayflower Hotel in Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. in 1998. I saw him on the boulevard and I ran up to him and I said, your book, Unsafe at Any Speed, changed my life. I, am, I want to be a consumer advocate like you. Can I have your autograph? And he said, young man, I don't give autographs. Tell me your name and why don't you walk with me to the Washington Post and tell me what you're doing for a living. And did you? I did. Two years later, <laughs> I was a major volunteer in his 2000 campaign in Portland. 
Uh -huh. He gave me a media pass. I was at the uh, Moda Center down there in the press asking questions with all the national press. I had backstage uh, passes when he did his rally. Yeah, he is inspiring, he very inspiring. Yes. Yeah, and of course Mahatma Gandhi and his sense of, you know, violence begets violence and we need to uh, take a stand and what does that look like? Inspiring, the movie, the movie about his life uh, was, I've seen it five times, it changed my life. I also appreciate Manning Marables, I appreciate Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, um, Jesus Christ in, you know, the radical revolutionary that I believe that he was. Those people inspire me. You're too far out. <laughs> I am? Uh oh. No, <laughs> I'm no, in the wrong no, country. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, you, do you read or view alternative media at all? I do. One of my favorite shows is Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. Hey, did you see it this morning? I did not see it this morning. Oh, just, it's wonderful. Yeah. Just wonderful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a break away from that M MSNBC habit uh, this yeah, morning, but I've been watching that for the last three days all morning for just to try to figure out what's going on. Watch this morning's yeah. show. I also listen to KBOO Radio an awful lot, and mm -hmm. I watch your programs. Mm -hmm. I watch Community cable, Public Cable Access oh, when man. they re broadcast them on YouTube. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, what's most important nowadays? You, the, Three most important things that we should be concerned about as human beings. I think primarily, particularly if we're thinking about folks like me over the age of 50, loneliness. Loneliness. And then the other part of that is intimacy. And we need, we are, like I talked about, we need safe humans to accept us and feel comfort around. We need to find our people and find our tribe. And for a lot of people, they're disconnected. Their social groups, their community groups have dried, dried up because everybody's on the Facebook having pseudo intimacy in digital life, but we're, we're not bringing our bodies and our sense organs into such experiences. So community, community, community. Intimacy and kindness and acceptance of others who have different uh, opinions than us, but still need to be loved and feel part of the human family. Everybody in. I've got a trick. You're reading it right here. This is my favorite provocative sign that I wear. And the reason I do is because of intimacy and the approaching intimacy. It's somewhere closer to real intimacy when a person sees me and there's something happens in our look, in our experiencing with each other, vibrations or whatever, and particularly little old ladies, you know, and they get teary-eyed. Can I have a hug? You've been made not just my day, but yeah, a whole damn yeah, month. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Be kind. So being kind, uh, even unkind people, people read this, they get all kinds of reactions. Mm -hmm. Even now and then, somebody who's really offended or scared. Mm -hmm. But by and large, there a sense of possible intimacy. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. I agree. Sometimes when I'm not doing some policy work, I like to take the 82nd Avenue bus out to the Goodwill in Clackamas. And sometimes in the morning, there's an, the whole bus will be filled of, um, of Chinese and Philippine and Vietnamese women going to their jobs, and just their, their authentic warmth and smile. I think the TV generation has uh, affected our affect, and these people who come from other places and their sense of warmth and genuineness uh, it just fills up my heart. It's just heartwarming, and to see them smile at me because I'm silly, uh, you know, Jim Carrey kind of character sometimes <laughs> yeah. in public, and it's, yeah. Yeah, and it seems like we have lost our other senses that are, that are all ill-defined nowadays because our senses are occupied now with those things that we, can, we are aware of, like sight, sense, hearing. Right. And a sense of hearing, we, uh, we don't, we're not aware of the natural Sounds or, uh, that are going about. And, uh, 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 I'm losing myself. But no, but you're, you're completely on point. Marshall McLuhan, who was the a tech a Catholic, went, was a professor at a Catholic university in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He talked yeah. about we have been in human form for maybe a half a million years. It is only the last 25, 50 years that we've been staring at a glass box 
that has the brightness of a small sun that we're staring at at six hours a day. What is that doing to the rest of our sense organs? There's a theory that suggests we spend so much time staring at extremely bright objects, uh, TV screens, CRTs, computer screens, that it speeds up our occipital lobe in the back of our head where our vision processing in to the detriment of our prefrontal cortex and our lobes slowing down blood flow in the critical part of uh, uh, what our front part of our brain does. Yeah. It's, a, it's challenging. My issue is not with the baby boomers or the Generation X because they still remember community, they still remember intimacy, but it's the young people, the digital natives who are growing up with a screen in front of their face. They're lacking, they're, they're pruning their emotional development as human beings. And, w and we think it's just natural. Occasionally, like in a supermarket, I'll see a mom or a dad even with a little kid uh, it's on months old and they've got a little computer. Little kids, oh, they're learning to use computers before they even learn to talk. Yeah, now it's, is there some, should kids have iPads? I don't know if they should have iPads or not have iPads, but should the mother and the kid make consequential, important eye contact through the day, particularly at zero to three years? Yes, those, you need to know that you're bonded with this figure because you don't have it all figured out. You're, you're not even rationally and cognitively complete. And so your mom's, I walk through the Pearl District, a mom will be on her iPhone pushing her kid here, the kid is crying or something, and she's shopping for boots at Macy's while her kid is looking around trying to make eye contact with her primary caregiver. It's a, it's a we, are, we are hefting a consequential attachment disorder on our infants without marked pathology. It's just ne neglect and distraction. And that's going to have consequences to intimate relationships. Your future is assured in the kind of work you're doing now because generations from now, we're going to need more like you yeah, to, well. to continue your work. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes, and uh, good, good work it is. But anyhow, let's take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about the politics of mental health funding. That's terribly very important. Very good, very good. Okay. Okay, we're back. I got so busy talking to my guest here. Thanks for staying tuned. For you viewers who missed the, the opening of this show, Conversations with Dr. Don, is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like my friend Kevin over here, about who he is and about whatever it is we've decided to talk about tonight. And again, we're talking about the politics of mental health funding, and we should what does that mean, the politics of mental health funding? This is the journey that I've been on for the last three years is try to understand. I started with a concept. I want this to happen. I want Governor Brown to pay for this service. This, I want her to fund this mental health services. How does that work? You just go knock on her door and say, Governor Brown, here's a great idea. 14 states are doing it. They're producing tremendous outcomes. I want some funding for my, this mental health service. Mm -hmm. um, they said, you this, is not the po this is not how <laughs> you exhibit the politics <laughs> to get mental health funding. You need to learn the game. And so what I've been on is a journey of three years to try to understand 
how does a citizen, just a, re a citizen, or actually I'm a customer of the state of Oregon because I'm on public uh, mental health services and insurance because of my Medicaid, trying to learn what is the process to get a mental health service funded, whatever that mental, whatever your mental health service is, there's a process to get that funded and trying to explore what that looks like and how a person who's a rookie and a volunteer, I'm not a professional lobbyist, and I don't have a political action committee, so I, don't ha I can't send them to uh, you know, Hawaii on a winter junket. Uh, you know, I can't take them out to the ringside. Has she gotten state. tired of you harassing her for three years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she had <laughs> policy advisors who said, I want to teach yeah. you this process. Mm -hmm. I want to show you how this works or how you start this process. And, How's she responding? Uh, well, I had fantastic, uh, uh, the retired Governor Kitzhaber had two policy aides, a woman named Pam Curtis and Mark Gibson, who were essential early on in trying to un tell me this is how you take your idea, turn it into a concept, submit that concept to a state lawmaker, and put it in the legislative mix. And you went through the steps. I went through the steps. And here we are, uh, May, March 25th, 2019. Two weeks ago, we had a hearing uh, by the Oregon State lawmakers in the House Health Committee, and, they, and the mental health service that I'm working f feverishly to try to get uh, enacted just passed the health committee with one abstention and no no votes. We couldn't find anybody in clinical practice in the state of Oregon who was against the mental health service model that we were talking about. The veracity of its clinical model and its effectiveness and outcome, we could not find anybody to say that that is not true. The challenge that we have is and we're in a revenue, uh, we're in a negative revenue situation. Currently, legislative session could go as long as June 11th. Uh, and so we're in a, uh, so we're, or July 11th. So we are in it, but we're in a negative revenue session. Uh, we have like 300, 400 million dollars in the hole due to Medicaid that we need to find funding for. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is the mental health service funding that I was looking for, people agree. Yes, if we had the money, we would buy this service today. If we had the money, if we had the money sitting around, we believe this is an essential service of our system and we would purchase it. Unfortunately, we don't have an extra two and a half million dollars to pilot this, but stay tuned because legislative session, like I said, is still gonna is still going on. That's a left wing government, is it, in Oregon? Uh, it probably, it, I would say, it probably is, except in the area when you start getting into the intricacies of mental health services. We're talking about some very large corporations, although some of them are nonprofit corporations. But they're very large corporations. Profit and I, is pri primary is first. Yeah, yeah. Well, some of these nonprofits actually operate almost like a for-profit in the way they're inaccessible. That they have a ten-person public relations team. They put out good commercials and good advertisements. But listening to the grassroots activists or the customers um, is sometimes gets short shrift. So but we're we trying to get in between those discussions and make noise. So we're heading in the right direction. We are heading in the right direction. And we're bringing forward the concept of what we, the mental health service that we're trying to get funded and what that means for the lives of people who are in pain and distress. Yeah, getting back to our questions here, we're talking about... Uh, the politics of mental health funding. Yeah. Peer respite. What, what is peer respite? So, well, that's what it says across my shirt. Can you see that all right? <laughs> I wondered if it, the font yeah. was too small. No, it's, it's okay. It's right. Right. Oh, okay, good, good. Right. right, so. Look at it. Oh, good, there it is right there. Good, right yeah. there. Uh, peer respite. So the font isn't too small. Good, it's so the right. viewers at home can see that. Oh, yes. So what, so what we have been focusing on with laser just uh, focused directly and specifically on one thing. We want, the mental health services that we want funded is called peer respite. And so if I could, I want to tell you what peer mean, what the word peer means in the, in the definition that we use in Oregon. Or maybe even respite, too. Yes, and there? respite. So let's start with respite. Respite means a place, uh, a break from something that's unpleasant or difficult to deal with. So that's a basic definition of respite. Yeah. When we're talking about community health services, whether an individual is suffering from dementia, somebody who is a hosp uh, in hospice care, 
uh, comes out from surgery in the hospital. Respite, what we mean in our health delivery system, is a place that you can go for a short abbreviated time, uh, five days, seven days, 14 days. And take the weight off of the pharma system. Right, and you might not need intensive medical support 24 seven. To get that earlier support. Right, or you might go from the hospital and you step down into a respite facility and stay there and so you have psychological and social support 24 seven. You also have uh -huh. folks there are trained, say that you're going to this place for respite and you're having a cardio event and you need to go to the hospital. There are people there 24 hours a day. If you're a person in psychiatric distress and you start having impulsive suicidality and you need to connect with the crisis line or the people at the locked psychiatric uh, facility, those people are there. So what we're trying to do in Oregon is look at what 14 other, the service that, the mental health service we want is peer respite. And what it means is, mm -hmm. it, is that if you are in psychiatric distress, but you're still able to manage your own symptoms so you're not uh, getting in other people's faces and you're not, a da you're not gonna commit suicide immediately, you don't have an active plan and you can manage your own affairs, but you need s some support around the clock for a brief period of time, you can voluntarily go and have your case manager or self-refer yourself, depending on the systems, and go stay in this peer respite house for you know, sometimes seven days or 14 days or five days or whatever. And we're looking at that model. Governor Kitzarber uh, gave me a grant. I was running a grant about a half million dollars a year for three years in the late 90s. I used some of that money to go out to New Hampshire. New Hampshire has been doing peer respite for 20 years and they, they realized that in between my house and the psychi psychi psychiatric ward, there is a lot of, le there is a lot of room between being legally holdable at a psych ward mm. and my house. And there's a lot of things that happen in the escalation of symptoms and the challenges of being alone that we think peer respite is a wonderful intermediate step in voluntary services for people who are in emotional or psychiatric distress. So a peer respite, is that doing any serious good? Yes, it is. Well, it's doing two good things. One is, I don't, does one go crazy in a minute or a second? I think it's a journey and it takes a while to get there. I don't think, and a person who's had 24, 25 psychotic breaks in my life, I didn't wake up one morning. See that 24, 25 psychotic breaks? I probably breaks had 24 or 25 psychotic breaks in my yeah, life. Yeah, we've talked in the past about yeah. my psychotic breaks, so no, close to it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I think I'm having one right now because, but. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't help it, can I you? I can't help it. So yes, is it helpful? It's very helpful. Why? Because we want to intervene earlier and I want to give you the tools. We'll say that you are a person in distress. I want to give you the tools to manage your symptoms and make choices about your care before the lid comes off, before you executive functioning uh, is all messed up, before you actually need medical professionals to intervene or are going to intervene legally. If we can give you the tools to manage your symptoms and get emotional supports, we can hopefully head off huge crises before they happen. Because you've been there. Exactly. And the person in need at that time would probably uh, appreciate your view and your sensing uh, so that they, you have a connection right. that will head off right. going further down the, right. down the tubes. Right. Would you ever buy a car from somebody who's never driven a car? No. Okay. <laughs> would you ever eat kale? Would you ever eat kale in a restaurant served by somebody who's never eaten kale before? I've never eaten kale. <laughs> okay. I won't. Well, you ought to start because I hear it's good for you. <laughs> but um, so what? We're, the important part when you marry the word respite, break, short time from difficult or painful experience. Sure. Peer. I am a person who has the experience of uh, psychotic disorder. I'm a person who's a recovering alcoholic. Those people who come meet you and they say, I've been there, I have some experience of some of this stuff. Now, it's probably not exactly your experience, yeah. but I want you to trust me as an ally, as a guide, as a Sherpa for this journey. And I'm not here to force you to do anything that you don't wanna do. I'm here to help uh, in, the, in, a, in an emergency situation if you need crisis services, but I'm also to help be a person that you can trust and share your feelings with 
and I can help you navigate and also let you know that there is an awful lot of us in the community. And I can recognize you as a peer. Right, and right. I more respect for you right. than a guy with a PhD or the MD. Right. And we're building community where we come okay. and we build friendships Which amongst is those. overriding everything yes. else. Yes. Yeah. 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 See, all oh, right, man. So Peer. that's the mental health funding project that we're trying. That's the mental health service we're trying to get funding for in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And you're making progress. We're making very good progress mm. uh, on the acceptance of the model. The money part, we'll see. We won't know probably until uh, probably early June whether they came up with some revenue package to to keep them from making cuts. So we'll see. So 14 other states have <clears throat> peer-run respite. Right, right. 14 other states. So New York, uh, California, Ohio, big, big, big states. Yes, yes. That have, you know, we're 4 million. They're 40 plus million in California. So they have a lot more folks who are uh, in need of, who are getting mental health services in the public sector. And they're spending, the two most expensive things in mental health service delivery in the public sector are pharmaceuticals and hospitalization costs. And what is the plan, if you ask the people who run these systems, do you, is it a goal to divert people from the hospital if they don't need it? Is it a goal to reduce your cost of pharmaceuticals if the patient wants to choose another route or if they've recovered or on the road to recovery and that isn't something that works for them or they needed it at, for a short term. What about the corporations and, and the people who make uh, OxyContin? They need to make their money too, don't they? What comes first? Well, I can't really speak Profit for them. Makes first. Yeah, yeah. I can't speak for them, but I do think that they have a responsibility. All of them have a responsibility yeah. to give me 10% of your budget and we'll build community and we'll reduce hospitalizations, we'll reduce the, uh, the reliance on psychiatric medications and these people will get back into their community doing volunteer work, doing part-time work, um, getting connected to other communities. But you'll be cutting into my profit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> you work for Eli Lilly. <laughs> that sounds you're, like... you're not dressed like one of them. <laughs> You dress like an old college professor, my, my <laughs> sociology professor. What differs from an inpatient unit? How is it less traumatizing? So we want to make the clarity, and this is just the thing that I, so if psychiatric distress um, starts, if most people, neurotics, I, I like sometimes for, the short, for a shortcut, let's divide the world in neurotics and psychotics, and yeah, psychotics sure. Neurotics are, psych are psychotics are neurotics who lost control of, or they think they lost control. Yeah. So if one to five is neurotic mood, six to ten is the starting of psyche of a crisis, a mental and emotional crisis that is rising. If we can intervene at a six, seven, or eight, then we don't need to put them in. We don't need to take them to a psychiatric ward. Understood. In Oregon. You cannot, especially in the metro area, you cannot voluntarily go to the psychiatric hospital and say, let me in. You could, but the people who are being involuntary, taken in by the police and the ambulance, are clogging. There's too many of those folks clogging in the front door. We are saying, let's put another step below that, an alternative to hospitalization that meets some of these people's needs that don't need to be, or that are not at a 10 or 11 but need some more supports than beyond what they can just get at their house. So 14 other states who, where they pay their mental health directors a lot more than we do here mm -hmm. um, have realized this saves money, it builds community, and gets these people into the issues of self-determination, making choices about their treatment, becoming more responsible about what they want, and goal-directed. I think we can't, we can't overemphasize the importance of peer directed. We cannot. We cannot, yeah. right? Right. It would not be the same model. The same thing, and we mm -hmm. say it over and over again, uh, it was in the early 80s, women who had breast cancer and were survivors of breast cancer starting to form support groups, just organically grown support groups of I have this challenge, I have this challenge, show me the road ahead, tell me about mistakes, be my partner when I get frustrated. So Alcoholics Anonymous, same thing, one alcoholic helping another started in 1935. When Vietnam vets came back from the Vietnam War and they were spit on and they were hated, 
they found community amongst each other saying, let's nurse our own worlds, let's build community centers where we can accept ourselves. The same thing is happening in public peer, mental Peer again. Yes, peers or the, uh, the language that they also use, mental health consumer or psychiatric survivor. There's a lot of folks who have been traumatically damaged by aggressive, violent psychiatric interventions, holding them down, giving them shots, giving them uh, electroconvulsive therapy against their will. You cannot both be my warden and my therapist and expect that the trust and the relationship. Trust. Mm, 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 so mm, that's, mm. so you're exactly right. We, can, we, will not, we cannot talk about respite and the importance and the meaning of it and the outcomes that we're seeing without the peer attached to it. We're talking about uh, level of care, higher level of care. What if a person needs a higher level of care? How many people could be served a year? You can reference bed nights, six beds times three locations, and all these numbers here. So what we try to make this saying is if you're paying, if you're the public taxpayer, you're paying $2,000 a night approximately to keep me in a locked psychiatric ward. Albeit there probably are, and doctors would make the argument that there are people that need to be in a locked psychiatric ward. However, there are people who cannot stay at their house tonight because they're having challenges in extreme states, but they're not ready to jump off a bridge and they're not ready to hurt themselves or hurt anybody else, but they need company and they need emotional supports around the clock. What those folks are trained and they're certified by the state, if this person is in your, and you're giving support services and this person's uh, impulsivity or self-harm challenges start to manifest and escalate, you're tied into the co continuum of care in the community so you can connect them to a higher level of care. And those are crucial and that's why the peer services and the peer respites that are really thriving are an integral part of in between your house and the locked psychiatric ward where you can go voluntarily. Well then, how do you get people to talk to and be with so that they can avoid going into the higher levels. Well, yeah. we so, so first of all, the state of Oregon for six years, maybe seven years now, has a program where you can go and get professional training and certification, uh -huh. background check, where I'm a licensed peer service support worker. Licensed so, by the state. Licensed by the state. I'm a peer service support worker. Peer service so, support yeah. worker. And yeah. so you get trained on all of the things of like community access, how you access the crisis line, how that you connect people to hospitalization, and particularly peers that work at these homes, know the up and downs of how do we move, let's just say John Doe, because we don't want to say anybody's name. I'm a homeless citizen, and I'm really difficult psychologically, and how, how do I find you? So the model is different, and there's 33 of them, 32 of them operating right now, and plans for a lot more of them in 14 different states. Some of them, some of them say we don't take folks that are homeless. Others say we take the folks who are homeless uh, just like we take anybody else, but there's only a certain duration of stay. No one can stay belong behind 14 days. The good thing is though, so if you're homeless and you are going through a distress, but you're not you know, at the highest end of the scale, you can connect with the peers who have a community of peers. There's peers working in the big box agencies all over the state in the big the big ones, and so you can connect them with resources of shelter, of housing, of uh, food stamps, and those sort of things while you're there at the, at the peer respite. Have you been homeless? I was homeless for two days. I was I, without my own home for three or four months, but I had a girlfriend who lived at Portland State, and then I ended up staying on my sister's couch. So, so yeah. not technically, not very long. I slept on a heating vent in Northwest Portland for a night. Wow. I had one brief adventure that, uh, in, in that whole uh, family of, of, of distress. I was hitchhiking from Northern California because uh, I was going to go experience being a hitchhiker deliberately. I had credit cards and I had money. Did you read Jack Kerouac's book or something? I, didn't read, I don't read it yet. But anyhow, I was trying to hitchhike to go, to go back to uh, L.A., where I came from. And it took me about you know, 16 hours, and finally I, I, I gave up, and I found a bus station. Mm -hmm. But being alone on, on the on-ramps, uh, somebody dropped me off here, and I, and, and I 
be trying to hitchhike some more, and for hours on end, and nobody would would recognize me. And there's a, a sense of being forlorn, but I was determined to get. But I didn't make it to L.A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I finally went to a bus station. Oh, wow. and what hired year a bus. was this? Was this in the late fifties or sixties? Oh yeah, yeah, about then. Yeah, late fifties. Yeah, but that was a quite an experience, and it, it lasted for a long, long time. That being alone and nobody cares. The mm -hmm. idea is nobody cares. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So I don't know how that fits in with that, yeah. but I wanted to tell you that story. Well, it's again. completely important. Completely important. Whenever I, I, st I got training to work on a suicide hotline, I never actually took the job, but I got training. And one of the things they wanted to impart to you is we want you to make sure that the caller understands that you impart, that their life has meaning and they are worthwhile and that you care about them. You care about them as another human being who's suffering and you don't want them to hurt themselves. And, and, they, they, and they can sense it. If you've been there particularly, yes, then yeah, they can sense yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And the people who have been there are far less likely to direct you to something that's gonna impair your choice or is gonna traumatize you. People who drive cars are much better about telling you about the experience of driving a car than people who have never driven a car. People who have been patients, people who have been in psych wards, people who have had psychotic distress, people who have done self-harm or been on the edge of suicidal self-harm can understand that feeling, that mind state, that body state, that alienation in the world of no one cares about me, why don't I, what, you know what I mean, just finish the sentence with something tragic. It's amazing, the continuum of people who are on one or two and then moving up the, uh, the scale and uh, various degrees of that going and it's hard to figure out uh, actually how much is nature and how much is nurture and all the ingredients. But then the bottom line is to have a connection, a right. human connection, where we are by bypassing the, uh, the, 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 the televisions and, the, and those uh, cell phones and all those kinds of devices. I completely agree. I'm, I chair a subcommittee of the state of Oregon called Tools, Technology, and Access. What do we need as customers and what do we need as activists to be more effective to compete against big pharma for-profit Medicaid managed care. How, how can we do that? And some of them are tools, but we also need to remember that we are pushing forward a movement of heart and acceptance and kindness, a tent for everybody who has similar wounds and experiences to feel accepted. And we need to remember we're building a platform to grow a community. I think the odd, the nervous, and the awkward, and the shy are uh, the leading edge of where we need to go in helping humans comfort themselves. Wow. You're blowing me away again. Over well, sorry. Again. <laughs> no, 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 don't apologize. <laughs> yeah. But I really think your point, that point, does anybody care about me? Does anybody, anybody care, care about me? And sometimes the dark thoughts and dark moods, maybe someone does care about you, but you're in such a fog, you're in such a, uh, a place where you can't feel that visceral connection, so what comes next is disaster and, 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 and self-harm or abandonment of your own respecting and treating yourself well. So, f so feeling like I matter to somebody in the world, that I'm important, somebody sent me a birthday card, somebody said good morning to you, somebody, I was crying on the street and somebody said, is, are you gonna be okay? It's just a stranger. And you could tell by their affect that it wasn't just some song and dance, phony, flaky, passive aggressive sort of thing you just do and keep on moving while you go get your kale at the bourgeois grocery store. That there are, you know, people respond, we respond when people know, sense that we're in pain. And instead of telling us of shut up or get out of here, it's how can I be of help or can I just sit here and be with you? How can we bottle this and have it available for people who are in serious trouble? Well, we're just like this. We're telling the people about it. We're telling the people, we're using media to tell people about why the peer revolution is so beneficial to just, not just people in mental health services, but to older people, to young people. Is there anybody who gets out of this life without either having a friend, a parent, a child, a daughter, a student who has some sort of mental, emotional addiction uh, alcoholism issue. We're running out of time and I want you to talk to the viewers. Oh, this one over here. 
wait, wait, without me, uh, whatever you want to say about what we talked about this evening, okay. and whatever. Okay, okay, please, yeah. So I want to, we, like I said, the topic was uh, the politics of mental health funding. We've been working on three years to fund this peer respite model, alternatives mm -hmm. to hospitalization for people in psychiatric distress. So we actually have currently, on March 25th, 2019, a bill in the Oregon State House called HB 2831 to fund three peer respite centers, one in the metro area, one in southern, area, one in southern Oregon, and one in eastern Oregon. So we just want to let you viewers stay tuned about the adventure of peer respite, the journey of peer respite, and hopefully someday with your help and our friends help in media, get the message out there, why it's important, why it's valuable, why it's cost saving, and why it saves people, people's lives. And I want to thank you for, I don't know what you, have, is this your thousandth episode? I'm not sure. But you have a fascinating catalog of very interesting individuals. Because they're people like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about time to shut down now, so we're going to put up a couple of public service announcements. Uh, I want to tell you about The Nation. That's one of the uh, oldest publications in America, uh, left, progressive, uh, liberal, and they've been around for a long, 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 long time. Go to that website, www.thenation.org, to learn more about them. And the uh, American Civil Liberties Union. I started off the show reading a... a uh, an email I got from the ACLU, and I talked about that earlier on. The ACLU, I've been a member now for 4,000 years, and without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be gone completely from America. And uh, to learn more about the Alliance for Democracy, go to the, the national website. The Alliance for, Democ Alliance for Democracy is an organization I belong to, and there's a website for them, the local. Yeah, and ah, uh, we've got to end corporate personhood. That will be a, a solution for a lot of our problems. High five gonna... for that one. <laughs> yes, corporations are not people. And money is not speech. We're going to move to amend.org yeah. and learn more about ending corporate personhood. And I'm going to tell you about... Thanks for watching. And remember KFC, and not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable to you too. And you too, and you too. <laughs> Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.